All right. <laughs> I like it. And thank you for the shout out in the back. Yeah, I appreciate that. Can you all hear? Is this okay? You can hear well enough? Okay. Um, I've already talked to several of you and asked you not to ask really hard questions. And so I'm just going to implore all of you not to ask really hard questions. When they asked me to give a talk, um, being a historian of science, and I thought, well, I've, I've got several topics that I'm interested in giving. And so I made a long list of potential topics. And then I thought, well, it's close to Halloween. It's like the day before Halloween. Let me throw this one in there. And this was the one that Paul actually picked. And then he didn't show up. So <laughs> I mean, he's going to, he'll hear about it later. Um, just a caveat, like I, I am not, I am a historian of science that masquerades as a historian in a history department, but I am not an enlightenment historian. I'm not a history of chemistry as, or a historian of chemistry either. My background's kind of the history of biology, but I do teach uh, history of science, and this is, this is material that's come out of a variety of lectures that I give in my history of science class. So I've, I've already made several promises not to bore anyone as well. So we'll see if I can, if I can live up to that particular promise. Um, also, I'm going to implore Rob to please keep time and make sure I don't go over, because I don't have students falling asleep to, to keep me on track. So. so the topic tonight is, like I said, the science behind Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And we all know the story, although we may not necessarily know the story. We, may not, we think we know the story, but we may not necessarily know the story. Um, several years ago, when I taught a history of science class, I went back and um, I decided to teach like a science fiction section where I did The Island of Dr. Moreau and Mary Shelley. And so I reread the work again. And my, my preliminary knowledge of Frankenstein really comes from Mel Brooks, right? <laughs> right, young Frankenstein. Um, and so, so the, the story is completely different. So I was really surprised when I went back and I read it how different the story is. And then I was even more surprised exactly how many scientific references and how much um, history of science is actually in that particular story. And so it was really exciting to be able to teach that in the context of a history of science class. Um, we also, I, I should also put the caveat in there that I'm not a Shelley historian either. Um, but this is, this is Mary Godwin Shelley. She was born to uh, two really incredibly famous um, political figures. Uh, her father was William Godwin, who was a well-known political theorist. He was kind of a radical for the time period. Uh, he, <laughs> he decided to um, basically decry the institutions of government and marriage. Um, and then he turned around and married uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and then married another woman after that. So he, he didn't necessarily live up to that philosophy. But he, he was a radical during the Enlightenment who invited radical figures in to his home quite a bit. Um, he had a bookstore uh, and he had um, b believed passionately about the education of children and so he believed that his daughter should be well ed educated as well. And so she had access to a lot of books, she had access to a lot of thinkers um, and ideas and she would, with her sister, actually frequently go down and to uh, kind of sneak into his, um, his uh, library and sit and listen to him talk with his fellow political uh, philosophers that made their way to their bookstore. So, so he was an incredible influence. <clears throat> His mother, or her mother, I should say, was Mary Wollstonecraft. And Mary Wollstonecraft was a radical in and of herself. Um, she believed in free love, um, actually um, didn't believe in marriage until she does end up marrying William Godwin. Um, she was probably considered the first feminist, right? She wrote, wrote the first, uh, they call her a proto-feminist, feminist track on the vindication of the rights of women, <clears throat> where she makes an argument for the rights of women, essentially. So it's one of those foundational classic texts that anybody in sort of the history of feminism uh, has to encounter, because she, she really is the first one to make these arguments uh, in the West. Unfortunately, she died about 10 days after Mary Shelley was born. And so she, her daughter never had uh, her mother's influence. And so she, she was profoundly influenced by the lack of influence, but she did she did kind of take on the spirit of her mother where she questioned everything and was very intellectual and very interested. So, so I say all this just to let you know that she came from a family that was very intelligent, very interested in things, and um, had access to a lot of really unique ideas as a, as a young girl. She married, well, she ran away with, I should say, first. And when she was seven, 16, she ran away with Percy Bysshe Shelley, uh, who was already married and had a child. 
um, he believed in free love as well. And I mean, so all of these people that believed in free love actually end up having very traditional relationships. And so they end up getting married a couple years later. But when she's 16, she meets him in Scotland. Um, he implores her to run away. And she and her sister actually run away with him. And they end up marrying a couple years later. He is a great poet. Um, he, again, surrounded himself with a lot of really influential, brilliant minds, and um, he influenced her quite a bit as well. And so a lot of his influence is gonna factor into the story of Frankenstein, even though he doesn't write the book. He does help edit it. He does influence it with a lot of his interests. So he's gonna play a really pivotal part in the creation of, of this particular, of, of Frankenstein. <clears throat> Talking fast. <laughs> so, the, how did the story start? So in 1816, Percy and um, Mary Shelley, well, she wasn't Shelley at this point, but Percy and Mary uh, Godwin and her sister went and stayed with Lord Byron in, uh, on Lake Geneva in Switzerland. And this was what, what was called the year of no summer. So there had been the previous year a volcanic eruption in the East Indies which basically completely changed the environment in Europe. So it was a very cold summer. Um, most of the time they would have been out hiking and, and sort of wandering the countryside, but because of the cold temperatures of this particular summer, they spent a lot of time inside, around the fireplace, telling Gothic German ghost stories. And so they would entertain each other by telling these ghost stories, and Lord Byron came up with the idea of Let's have a contest. Let's each of us write a story and see who can scare each other the most. And so they went about writing. She had writing block for a few days, and then she went about writing. And she is the only two. So there were, I believe, four people that participated, five people, four people that participated in this contest. Two of them actually ended up publishing. Um, and she was one of the ones that ended up publishing. So she was the only one, she, one of the two that finished the story and ended up publishing the story. And so this is a, an image here of Lord Byron, the home where they, they shared. They actually were just, they were down the road. They weren't in the same home, but this was his home where they, they kind of went around the fireplace. And this is an actual manuscript. This is her manuscript um, that she worked on while she was there. The book was published in 1818 when she was just 21 years old. I always, I always ask my students, what were you doing when you were 21? I mean, because I was not doing anything that involved writing or, or publishing or anything like that. Um, but she was 21 years old, and I think that speaks a lot to her education and the influence that she actually had growing up. Uh, this is actually an image of a, a rare first edition copy of, of Frankenstein. It came in three volumes. And um, they are pretty expensive. I went and I looked. And, and there were only 500 copies that were originally printed. And they sold out uh, rather quickly. And so they had numerous reprintings. And again, this is the story. Frankenstein is the story of Victor Frankenstein, um, who decides to um, create life. And he deals with the consequences of, of essentially taking this knowledge that he has access to and, and using it to create life and then rejecting that life because he considered it hideous and unhuman. Um, so th there's a lot of actually themes that could be discussed here that don't have to do with the science behind it. A lot of themes about rejection, about love, about parentage, about all of these things. Um, but that essentially he creates a m monster and then rejects it because it's too hideous. And it's also the story of the monster's revenge. So the monster is very aware of this rejection, is very affected by this rejection, tries to um, appeal to his creator to create uh, a another monster for him. Victor Frankenstein does this and then finds that it's so hideous too that he destroys the monster that, that he had created for his original monster. And this causes him to you know, basically seek his revenge on Victor Frankenstein. Frankenstein kills a number of, of relatives, etc., and confronts him a number of times, basically stalks him. So it's, it's really a story about love and revenge, but within it is a lot of science. And so I'm going to talk to you about the context behind the story, um, the Enlightenment, and then the science that occurred during the Enlightenment. <clears throat> so the Enlightenment, 
was probably one of the most fascinating periods in, in history. Um, it was a period in which people believed that the universe was fundamentally rational, that truth could be uncovered, be it truth about the universe or truth about humanity, uh, could be uncovered through a rational, experiential um, exploration of the world. I mean, very much our world that we live in, and I, I, I typically don't preach to scientists, but very much the wor scientific world that we live in is a product of, of the Enlightenment. This idea that you could go out and you could observe nature and you could observe humanity and you could use that knowledge to create um, to create um, other knowledge but also to create better institutions within humanity. This is, this is actually probably one of my favorite images ever. This to me represents the Enlightenment. Uh, this is the frontispiece to a book called the Encyclopedia. It was actually a series of books. It was about 35 volumes of books. Exquisite, large, beautiful books. And it was, it kind of symbolizes to me the Enlightenment because it was a collection of all of the known knowledge at the time period. So there were only over 78,000 articles within these 35, 35 volumes. Everything from information about religion to politics to mining techniques to discussions of birds and bees and surgical instruments. Um, it, it, was, it was an exquisite collection of books. And I was telling my students today about how I had a, when I was at the University of Oklahoma, I had a carol which was from here to the wall from the vault. And so I had the opportunity to go in to, and to, to actually paw through these books when I was a graduate student. And you just don't see books like this anymore. But the frontispiece, I think, tells the story of the Enlightenment. So you have at the front, um, or at the very top there, you can see that's it's sometimes interpreted as reason, sometimes interpret, interpreted as truth. But, but basically, reason and truth are at the top. The light is shining from them. Um, someone is lifting the veil from truth and reason. Um, basically is showing her secrets to the world. Um, and so that was the process of science, is uncovering the veil and showing the secrets of nature to the world. Below that, in the clouds, and you'll, you'll note that this part here above is in the clouds, right? So this is a very ethereal image. Um, the sciences are all gathered around reason and truth. And if you look at this image closely, you can identify particular sciences. Um, you have. Um, botany, and this is the one I can point to right here, botany is right there. Um, but the, the sciences are all gathered around. And then below, in the human realm, you have the male scientists, right? And so these were the, the men who were, at this point, only men were participating, that's not true. Um, only men were participating in a professional way in the sciences, and that's not completely true either. So, <laughs> but, but in this, it's represented as a marriage. The reason that the males are represented as a scientist, the female muses are the sciences, is that oftentimes they talked about this fusion as a marriage, as a relationship. They also sometimes talked about it as an, an aggressive sexual relationship as well. And so there's some language there about um, wrestling nature by the hair and withdrawing her secrets from her. Uh, so it's, it, it depends on who's writing. But it gives you an idea that during the Enlightenment, they were interested in the sciences. They were interested in collecting knowledge into these, these vast volumes of books. And then the other thing that they were interested in is experimentation. And so we'll see this image again here in just a little bit. But experimentation, they had access to um, they had access to uh, very, various experimental tools, various uh, machines. Um, you could go to the store and you could buy uh, microscopes. Um, you could go to the store and you could buy an air pump at, at local cellars in, in much throughout m much of Europe and actually in the Americas as well. And so people were doing experiments in these academies, in these societies, but also they were doing them in their homes. So that's another characteristic of this time period is that people were very much involved in philosophy in their homes, right? Um, one other point that I want to make about the Enlightenment before we move on is that it was not a speculative philosophy. It was very much a practical philosophy. So they weren't just sitting around guessing, and my apologies to my philosophy friends here, which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? <laughs> they were trying to solve actual philosophical um, institutional issues. What is the best form of government? Is a monarchy the best form of government? Is a republic the best form of a government? Um, what is the best way to pursue knowledge? What is the best way to educate children um, and to educate women? So all of these, oh, what is the best form of government? I think I just said that. Um, what, what is, is religion 
the best way to understand God, like which religion, which tradition within religion. So there were all of these various really practical things that they were, they were um, discussing as well. So this is, this is the world that Mary Shelley is being born into, right? These are, these are, this is kind of the climate um, that's swirling around during the time when she is a, is a young girl. All right, so now I'm gonna turn and talk about the science behind the book. Oh, one thing before I do that, I should go back to looking at that explanation. There was also an increase, um, increased uh, importance placed on education of children and women, too. So during her time as a young girl, she would have been educated more than she would have been if she was raised perhaps during the, the Renaissance or dur definitely during the medieval period. Um, and she would have had access to more education as a woman as well. It was completely accepted in this culture of the Enlightenment that women were, if not participating, they were at least observing and reading. So she was doing her duty by observing and reading. <coughs> All right. The science behind the book. I'm not going to cover all of it, just because I could be here all day if I decided to do that. But I'm going to cover some of the, the key ideas uh, that, that actually came out of the book. And the first thing that I wanted to talk about is natural philosophy. So during the Enlightenment, <coughs> excuse me, the word science didn't exist. It doesn't come into fruition until 1833. And so people called themselves natural philosophers. And in France, they called themselves philosophes. So natural philosophy was different than science today. Science is very much broken into individual disciplines. Natural philosophy basically encompassed everything. If you were a natural philosopher, you could do tests in an air pump on one day to investigate the basic, you know, sort of um, uh, the, what, is, what is life. You could, be, you could do experiments in electricity. You could do experiments in, or you could, you could study biology, uh, look at, at, at organisms. It encompassed a variety of different things. And so most of these people were not specialized in a particular area. They were, in many ways, Renaissance men and women. <coughs> But she completely, and actually this, this was brought to my attention by a colleague of mine who stopped me in the hall a couple weeks ago and said, she references three, three figures um, that play really a key role, or they, they, they play a role in the story of Frankenstein in that they influence Victor Frankenstein very early on. And the three figures are Cornelius Agrippa, Paracelsus, and Albertus Magnus. These are three, um, figures that in the history of science are considered kind of Renaissance um, medieval occultists, right? So Cornelius Agrippa was a German Renaissance occultist who believed that the only way to understand God was through magic. And so we see this, again, this, this melding of science or natural philosophy and magic. Um, we see, uh, and, and actually one of the things I wanted to point out since we're having kind of a Florence Prague reunion here tonight, that this was very common for the pursuit of magic during the time period, from the Renaissance, well actually from the, not just the Renaissance, from, from the ancient period on, but even during this time period where reason was supreme, people still turned to the occult sciences pretty frequently. So Emperor Rudolf um, employed astronomers, I'm sorry, astrologers and alchemists um, his court astronomers were also his court astrologers, Johannes Kepler and um, Tycho Brahe, who were not just trying to understand how the heavens moved, they were trying to make predictions for Rudolf so that he could make important decisions, right? So it was very common to, to participate in these occult sciences. Even Isaac Newton, right? We think of Newton and um, sort of as the, the foundation of the laws of motion, uh, calculus, all of these really important things. He was an alchemist, and in fact, probably the vast majority of his papers were in alchemy. He probably spent more time doing alchemy underground than he did actually doing the things that he becomes most famous for. So it wasn't uncommon, but it was increasingly during the, the 18th century becoming less accepted that magic and occultism would play a role within the sciences. But he's very influenced by Agrippa. In fact, that's his first influence and one that he's not able to give up on. And he actually makes the point that, and this is Victor Frankenstein, makes the point that it was Agrippa that actually led him to 
try to figure out what the foundation of life is and how to create life. Um, so, so it plays a pivotal role. He was also influenced by Paracelsus, who was a Swiss physician and an alchemist um, who believed that uh, the stars had an impact on the body and the way that you could de determine um, a person's illness was to understand how the stars affected that particular part of the body. Um, and then the other one that he was influenced by was Albertus Magnus, who was actually a medieval Din Dominican friar who believed in the radical notion that medieval scholars should read the Arabic scientists and the ancients. And again, during the medieval period, those of you from my Middle Ages class know that that was kind of, kind of radical uh, for the time period. And so he, he comes into this story very much influenced by this occultic magic um, philosophy and this idea that there's something out there to be uncovered and to be discovered. And so he's very inspired by that. The other thing, I need to take a drink. Hold on, stop. I'm going to stop for a second and take a drink. When I, when I get excited, I talk really fast. <clears throat> and I talk a lot. Right, Savannah? <laughs> um, the other thing that's important to note is that she's, Mary Shelley is being born into a world that is increasingly, increasingly mechanistic, right? This idea that God is a clockmaker and that the world is a machine, but also the idea that the body is a machine very much influences the science as well. The idea that you can take these various parts, put them together and make a clock. You can also take these various parts of a human, put them together, and create a human. And so he's very much playing on those ideas as well. Um, I'm gonna turn now to chemistry. So chemistry was probably the prominent science during the Enlightenment. Um, within Mary Shelley's lifetime, or actually probably the 40 years before her lifetime, the most sort of significant advances in chemistry had made. Like they went from a very little knowledge that was mostly tied to al alchemy to really a lot of knowledge and people were buzzing about chemistry. It was very, very prominent, very important. And she actually is very influenced by, by chemistry. In her story, she, she sends Victor Frankenstein to the university in Ingolstadt. And there he meets a professor who basically tells him, oh, what, you read Paracelsus and Magnus and, and Agrippa? You wasted your time. But then he goes and he meets another professor by the name of Waldman. And Waldman is based upon Humphrey Davy. Um, and, and he, or at least scholars think it's based on Humphrey Davy. He was a chemist who believed that not only were these ancient philosophers important because they were the foundation on which modern chemistry was built, um, he believed that modern chemistry provided hope for um, the future of the sciences and for answering some of the major kind of major questions in life. Um, actually, Humphrey Davy goes on to be one of the, the founders of um, chemistry and also electrochemistry, and he becomes really well known for doing uh, uh, experiments and giving lectures. He was a friend of William Godwin and he undoubtedly, I mean Mary Shelley undoubtedly went to his lectures and went to his public demonstrations. Um, he was, in, like I said, incredibly popular and you can kind of get a sense from this this image that you know he was, why he was incredibly popular. He was obviously a very <laughs> handsome man. Um, but he also even though he was popular later on for some of his experiments, he also was ridiculed for some of them. And so I just wanted to show you this other image. He worked for the Pneumatic Institute, and he was the first person to do systematic research on nitrous oxide and the effect that it had on the body and the medical uses of nitrous oxide, AKA laughing gas. And so for that, he was kind of ridiculed because there were all these political cartoons. And you can see here they were testing out nitrous oxide on various people to see what the effects were. Um, but out of that, we realized that we can use nitrous oxide to dull pain, right? So we have him to thank when we go to the dentist. <clears throat> so Waldman gives Victor Frankenstein kind of this promise of modern chemistry. And this is one of the quotes from the book. Um, he said, these philosophers, and this is Waldman delivering a lecture, which sounds a lot like Humphrey Davies' lecture that, that Shelley would have gone to. These philosophers whose hands seem only to have made dabbled in dirt and their eyes to pour over the microscopes or crucibles have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. 
They ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquakes, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. This inspires Victor Frankenstein to go out and obsessively pursue the question, what is the foundation of life? He also, the other thing that Waldman does is he encourages him, don't just be a chemist. You can also dabble in, in anatomical science. You can dabble in biology. You don't have to answer small questions within this single field. You can answer larger questions like, what is the, the basis of life? What is the foundation of life? But before, before you can actually build a body, you need bodies, right? So the next thing I'm going to talk about is anatomy. <clears throat> so prior to the 16th century, basically anatomical and medical knowledge was very limited. It was based upon the ancients, primarily Galen. Um, if you look at medieval anatomical texts, they didn't actually do dissections. Um, and it was considered taboo in Roman times, so Galen's knowledge of anatomy was minimal. It was based upon pigs and cows and rats and dogs and cats. Um, it wasn't based upon actually looking at the human body. In the 16th century, though, we see the development of the rise of humanity, partly because the medical sciences are professionalizing. And if you're going to be a good doctor, you probably need to know a little anatomy, right? Um, if you've seen medieval textbooks, you don't want your doctor to have studied from those, right? I mean, you would be in a lot of trouble. <clears throat> The, the person who kind of pioneers anatomical studies is the gentleman up here. This is a frontispiece to his book, uh, Vesalius, Georges Vesalius, and he publishes his book in 1543, and it's called On the, On the Human Body. Um, it's basically, he was the first to, he was a professor at the University of Bologna. He was the first to do actual dissections himself. So you can see him there in the middle. Um, I wish I could point to him. He's up there in the middle, the one actually doing the dissections. During the medieval period, if they did dissections, which they rarely did, um, you would have, the professor would read the book and they would have assistants that would be doing the dissections. But here, <coughs> he's surrounded by students. He's performing the dissections himself and he's teaching students on an actual human body. And this revolutionizes medical knowledge, it revolutionizes um, anatomical knowledge, etc. And so he publishes his book, and these are excerpts from his book um, on the, the fabric of the human body. These are, I consider these pieces of art, like these are works of art. So basically, what he did is he did a dissection, he would have an engraver come in and do, uh, to engrave an image of it. He would layer, pull away another layer. Of course, he did this over the, the process of multiple bodies. So it's basically, it's a walk through the body, all the way down to the skeleton. And there are parts where um, they also have the internal organs as well. Be he does this because he wants to correct the errors of the ancients. And so there are about 200 errors in Galen's anatomy um, that he is trying to correct. And like I said, after Vesalius, he's, he's a little bit before the time period that we're talking about, but I mean, it's Vesalius, so he's important to discuss. This, this anatomical schools flourish, right? We, we, we begin to see the rise of more and more schools of anatomy, more and more demand for bodies. And so the question becomes, how do you get these bodies? Um, in some countries, like in Italy, it was, it was easier to get a body, right? You could get a body from a criminal. Um, you could get a body uh, to dissect, like somebody who had been hanged for murder. Um, you could get somebody who might have, might have committed suicide, somebody who was poor and could not afford to be buried. So there, was, there were more access to bodies in other countries like Italy, where he was working, than there were in England. In England, the only way that you could get access to a body was in 1752, they passed something called the Murder Act. So only a person who was accused and hanged of murder would be allowed to be used for dissections. So there was an underground market, obviously, for human bodies. Um, they relied quite heavily on what they called, I love this name, resurrectionists. <laughs> Um, or they were also called sack em up men. <laughs> and, and this was a lucrative career. Like they could make some serious money. They could, 
there was a whole process to it, and I read quite a bit about the process, and I don't want to try it by any way, shape, or form. But they, they interestingly, actually, they're in, apparently in Scotland, we're going to have to go see this, apparently in Scotland there are cages over, over graves there, specifically to deter this from happening. <coughs> People started burying their loved ones in lead coffins. Um, or putting something on the top of their, their um, grave site to ensure that the grave robbers wouldn't come. But it was such lucrative business that, I mean, anybody, uh, everybody was fair game, right? So they were going out and they were getting access to probably 15 bodies a night um, to sell to these anatomical schools so they could do actual, actual dissections. Um, one, of the, one of the most well-known anatomist in London when Mary Shelley was growing up was a gentleman by the name of John Hunter. <clears throat> and he is, he's pictured here, he's a little blurry. Um, he was a well-known collector. He collected everything, anything and everything he could get his hands on. And most of the time he did it illegally, right? And he would, he would do it in a way that was private. He would not let people know what he was doing or who he was, who he was basically dissecting and then turning into a skeleton. Um, he wouldn't release that information, but he ended up with a really large collection, and, and part of his collection actually still exists. You can see some of it here. He didn't just collect humans. Um, he collected a variety of skeletons, but he did, you know, he did dabble in humans quite a bit. He collected quite a number of humans and skeletons. It was important to do because he could compare um, the different sort of the, the different functions, the different shapes of, of human um, bones and, and kind of compare. He could look for genetic disorders. He did a lot of, a lot of um, research on what caused certain things by, by dissecting the body, but he also was just simply a collector. And one of the, the, his most famous collections, which he collect, again, illegally, was the collection by an individual by the name of Charles Byrne, who was known as the Irish Giant. Um, Byrne was seven point, he was seven feet, seven inches tall. They, he actually, in order to make money, he sold himself as kind of a side, side show, said that he was eight foot tall and people would come to pay and see him. And he became aware, he was about 21, 22 at the time, he became aware that John Hunter was interested in his body. In fact, Hunter came to him and tried to buy him and said, you know, when, when you die, can I have your, can I have your body? Um, and, and Byrne did not want that to happen. So he created this plan with his friends that he was going to be buried in a lead coffin. Unfortunately, he does end up dying a year later. They put him in a lead coffin, and John Hunter got a hold of him. They were going to bury him out to sea, and Hunter ends up stealing him and getting him, and is actually, and this is, this is morbid, uh, but those are his feet in the image behind him. So when he was represented in his official portrait, he had Byrne placed behind him, the skeleton of Byrne placed behind him. This was going on when Shelley was a young girl in London. She undoubtedly heard about the grave diggers, about these grave robbers. She knew undoubtedly about um, Hunter and his collection and all of these things that were going on. And so this is fodder for her story And how do you get body parts, right? How does Victor Frankenstein get body parts? There's a few things she doesn't quite answer, like how is he able to get so many body parts? How does he preserve them? That's a, that's a whole other story for another time. She leaves a lot of things to the imagination, but there is knowledge that um, there was a market in body parts out there at the time. <coughs> Make sure I'm not going over. Um, Another question was, what is the source of life? So they were, they were playing with the idea, of Victor Frankenstein obviously is playing with the idea of what is the source of life? What is that spark? He calls it a spark, right? But it's not necessarily a spark. In fact, Mary Shelley doesn't tell us what generates life. She tells us that he with, uses the tools to uncover the secret to life, but never tells us what those tools were and what that secret of life was. But people during the time period were definitely speculating about what is the foundation of life. Um, people believed in this idea of spontaneous generation, that something can, can be spawned by nothing. Um, in fact, one of my students told me about the barnacle geese uh, earlier this week, and I happened to read about it. They believed that barnacles were, um, like, that, that barnacle geese actually appeared, were spontaneously generated out of barnacles. They didn't realize that the barnacle geese actually migrated and went away. Um, not, and and th they, they believed that, that when they came back, that is because the barnacles had generated them. Uh, they believed that, um, this is a, 
This is a sheep plant that sheep could be grown out of plants uh, from the ground. Frogs could be, could be spontaneously generated out of mud. So there was a lot of speculation about how something could transform from being alive, or from not being alive to being alive. Um, they also realized that there was something in the air that created life. Uh, the the Boyle's um, air pump, this is an image of people doing a, an experiment with an air pump. They realized that when you suck air out of an air pump, that the organism inside it will die. And so there's something in the air that creates life. Right? But the, the, she doesn't tell us what is the source of that life. She only tells us that there's something that is creating the life. And we speculate often that it's electricity. We don't know that for sure. But where do we get the idea of electricity? Basically, the media pop culture, uh, movies and films, I'm sorry, plays and films. So Mary Shelley tells us that Frankenstein is yellow skinned, very thin skinned, you can see his muscles and his arteries through it, he has black lips, um, he is, um, has watery eyes, long flowing black hair, he's not green, right? He's also very eloquent. If you read the book, he makes this impassioned plea to his father, you know, calling him father, why do you reject me? Why, you know, and so he's very eloquent, uh, very intelligent, but over time, Frankenstein becomes green and mute, right? He becomes mute during plays when they, they, they it's easier to pantomime um, after the, the publication of the book, and he becomes um, green with the 1931 film because the green paint actually reacted better with the film and it gave him this ominous white glowy look, right? And so it, it's the same with like the, the Wicked Witch of the West. She wasn't in the books green, right? It, it was a product of film. Um, from that, we also get the idea that Frankenstein had electrodes in his, the side of his neck. But again, there's no mention in the book that it was electricity that brought him to life. However, she hints at it. She hints at it quite a bit. She gives Victor Frankenstein a fascination in, in um, electricity. And at this point, they're, they're talking about electricity from, um, like, um, what is that, lightning lightning and stuff like that. And so this is a long quote. I'm not going to read it to you, but it's basically a scene where Victor Frankenstein as a young boy witnesses a tree being destroyed by electricity. And then he tells his father about it. And his father says, ah, yes, that's electricity. Let's do some experiments, right? Again, telling us that Mary Shelley did some experiments. And then he goes on to talk about how he made a kite with a wire and string, which drew down the fluids from the clouds. So she hints at electricity because she gives Frankenstein an interest in, Franken, in, in electricity. And electricity was all the rage during the Enlightenment. They did all kinds of, of ex exciting experiments on electricity, particularly static electricity. You've done these probably in the third grade where you took a balloon and you rubbed it against your hair and then you picked up pieces of, of paper or you, 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 know, you basically positioned it against the wall. People were interested in electricity and they were doing all of these really neat experiments with electricity at home. Um, these are two two experiments that were pretty common. This is called the flying boy, where they would suspend. So the gentleman that first did this, or this, this experiment actually ran a boys' school, and he would use his subjects in his experiments. He would suspend them. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questionable things that happened during the Enlightenment, right? right? We have ethics and science, et cetera, now, but not during that time period. So he would suspend them from silk rods, give them a charge, and then have him perform circus tricks, like turning the page of a book without touching it because of static electricity. Or you could go up and you could touch him, and a spark would be imparted to you. <laughs> Another game that I think is kind of fascinating was called the Venus Kiss, or the Venus Experiment. Basically, they would electrify a young woman who was standing in glass slippers or on something that was uh, glass that was an insulator. They would give her a charge, and then people would go up and kiss her, and the charge would be transferred to her. So this, this was party games. This was entertainment. This is what people did on a Saturday night. And she, of course, is, well, she and Percy are growing up during this time period. They're undoubtedly participating in a lot of these, a lot of these um, experiments. We also know that she knew about Benjamin Franklin's experiment with the kite, right? Um, Franklin was really interested in what was going on in Europe with electricity. He decided to turn what was a, a hobby into a passionate pursuit to understand the nature of electricity. We know about his kite experiment where he drew uh, electricity from the sky. Um, 
And she, I mean, we, we know from that quote that I just told you that she obviously was aware of that particular experiment as well. He, he, was not, he was not the only one that did it, but he was probably the best known for doing it and one of the first to do it. And it actually sparked a whole fashion trend called lightning rod fashion. Swear to you, he thought about, he decided to put lightning rods on the top of buildings and then people decided, well, why, I know that I could get hit by lightning. Why don't I put one on my umbrella or on my hat? And so people were walking around Europe with lightning rod hats and umbrellas. And so it sparked a whole fashion line as well. Spark, yes, pun intended. <laughs> Um, the, the last thing that I want to talk about is some of the, some of the more prevalent experiments with electricity that were going on um, during Shelley's time. And this was the experiments with galvanism. We know that Percy Shelley was fascinated with galvanism. Um, we know that people were, were sort of following the story and he was in particular fascinated with it. And they worked kind of collaboratively or they at least worked closely. And so he probably influenced her, her knowledge of galvanism and the influence that it had on Frankenstein. And basically what it is, Luigi Galvani believes that um, there is something called animal electricity because he, when you hook an electrode up to, um, to an animal's spine, and you create a current, it makes the legs of the frog move. He used frogs because frogs were easily accessible. He would hook the electrode up to their spine, he would give it a charge, the legs would move. Right? It, it made it appear like the frogs were alive. Maybe electricity is the source of life because it does cause things to, to move um, post-mortem. Actually, frogs can ironically move up to 44 minutes after post-mortem, and so there's a long period of time. And they were also using electricity and electrical sparks to try to um, revive people who were hanged as well. So this was very common floating around that people were thinking that maybe this animal electricity is the source of, of life. He published his findings um, and brought to the public sort of this idea that electricity can reanimate someone. But his nephew took it one step further. So his nephew, Giovanni Aldini, actually decided to step up his game and use something other than frogs. He used bulls. He started out using bull heads. Um, he would give an electrical shock. Their eyes would roll back. Their tongue would stick out. Their lips would curl. Their muscles in their face would move. And then when people grew bored of bulls, he moved on to humans. And he was doing public experiments on humans and trying to reanimate them. Um, one of his most famous experiments was on an executed criminal by the name of George Foster. And it actually prompted this cartoon here where um, Foster is coming back to life. But he, he made Foster basically um, his, his, his eyes open, his facial muscles moved, and he raised his hand and his legs moved. Right, so, so, so these experiments are going on. Um, she was living in a time when the world was filled with all of these little elements of the story of Frankenstein. Um, we know that she wrote this book for entertainment, but I happen to think she also had a message. And so I'm gonna leave you the final part with, with the message. There's a lot of messages here, but I think Mary Shelley's main message is about, it's a cautionary tale about the unbridled use of science and knowledge without sharing it. The Enlightenment was about open access to knowledge, sharing of information. Victor Frankenstein finds the spark of life, but he doesn't share it with anyone. And then he doesn't even think twice about creating this creature and unleashing it on the world until after he's done it, right? So he, he's not sharing the secret of life. It's not an open exploration of knowledge and advancement of scientific knowledge. And so she's very much cautioning about basically this unbridled use of knowledge um, and the um, and acting as God, as a creator, the scientist acting as God. This is a very similar um, sort of cry that we hear from H.G. Wells in The Island of Dr. Moreau and The Invisible Man. It's very similar to the sentiment that J. Robert Oppenheimer expressed post-Trinity test immediately after when he talks about I am he basically quotes the Bhagavad Gita. And then, of course, a lot of recent discussions about the ethics of, of cloning and playing God there as well. So I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you all for being such a great audience. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay.